what authority, what real functional authority does the Word of God hold in your life? Is it irrelevant to you? Now, if you're here this morning, it's, it's not likely, but I'm sure in a crowd this size that there's some people who find the Word of God irrelevant. They find it boring. Perhaps it's more common to see the Word of God as one source among many. It's, it's useful, it can be beautiful at points, but it's not unique. Or is it the very words of God, breathed out by God, inspired and inerrant, and therefore uniquely authoritative, and therefore uniquely transformative? We might say it this way. Does Scripture judge you Or do you judge scripture? Do you look to other authorities to decide whether or not you'll take God at his word? Or do you humbly submit to whatever the Lord reveals without qualification? John Calvin answered that question in this way. Those whom the Holy Spirit has inwardly taught truly rest upon scripture. I love that phrase. You come to scripture, you truly rest upon scripture. And that scripture indeed is self-authenticated. Hence, it's not right to submit it to proof and reasoning. And the certainty it deserves with us, it attains by the testimony of the Spirit. For even if it wins reverence for itself by its own majesty, it seriously affects us only when it's sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, illumined by his power, We believe neither by our own nor by anyone else's judgments that scripture is from God. But above human judgment, we affirm with utter certainty, just as if we were gazing upon the majesty of God himself, that it has flowed to us from the very mouth of God by the ministry of men. We seek no proofs, no marks of genuineness upon which our judgment may lean, but we subject our judgment and wit to it as to a thing far beyond any guesswork. Notice, I know that's a little bit of a dense quote, but notice how he links our attitudes towards Scripture, towards the Word of God, primarily to the work of the Holy Spirit. He's saying one of the main ways to know that you are spiritually alive, that, that God has made you His, is to assess your attitude toward God's Word. True Christians reverence the word of God because the spirit of God has taught us to do so. We don't look to other sources of authority to validate scripture and we certainly don't put ourselves above scripture. We truly rest upon scripture and we subject our judgment and wit to it. So one way to evaluate our attitudes towards God's word is when it's teaching greats against what all the cool kids think. And so in our day, that includes teaching like man and woman. It includes teaching like sexuality or politics, just to give a few examples. And and, and as we're confronted with the teachings of Scripture, Scripture is raising for us again and again the question of our glad submission to God. Will we love and trust Him, or will we strike out on our own thinking that we know better? Today's passage will press on us in uncomfortable ways, and especially because it focuses on the topics of sin and judgment. Today we're going to see the fulfillment of a prophecy that we read about several weeks ago in 1 Kings 19 when the Lord met with Elijah on Mount Horeb. So as by way of reminder, here's what he said to Elijah. And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. So the Lord is promising a terrible judgment to come upon his rebellious people, and he's raising up three leaders to accomplish that judgment. One is a godless Gentile. He's Hazael. He's going to be king of Syria. 
One is a man from the north, Jehu, who's going to be uh, the king of Israel. He's one of our primary characters today. And the final agent, agent of justice is Elijah's successor, Elisha, some of whom's acts of judgment we saw in last week's passage as Doug preached. Sin and judgment are, are always uncomfortable topics for us because we all know that we have fallen short in many ways and that we deserve, that we truly deserve the wrath of God. Romans 1 tells us that fallen man works tirely to suppress that knowledge in unrighteousness. We can find more ways to dance around accountability than a White House press secretary. So part of the task for the Christian is to actually humble our hearts and to open our eyes and to agree with God in his just verdict of complete opposition to all rebellion against him. If we would truly appreciate, if we would be rightly affected by the mercy of God held out to us in Jesus Christ, then we must recognize and agree with God's righteous and just and holy condemnation of our sin. As we do, the glories of Christ are opened up to us. In his word, the Lord holds out to us both his steadfast and unflinching opposition to sin and his patient and faithful work of redemption. The Lord opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we're going to see both of those dynamics at work in our text today. And as we do, we'll find that we're answering this question. In light of who the Lord reveals himself to be, how should we respond to him? The Lord's revealing himself to us in in every page of scripture and in light of who he reveals himself to be how how should we respond should we cower in fear should we rise up in defiance well we we know neither of those are appropriate there's only one appropriate response to a holy and just and merciful merciful and kind god and that is faith and repentance and in this passage we see it this way pursue wholehearted devotion to the lord for his promises are always sure Pursue wholehearted devotion to the Lord, for his promises are always sure. We're going to see the fruits of of, uh, rebellion against God, of half-hearted devotion to the Lord. And all those things are calling us to wholehearted devotion to the Lord, because his promises are always sure. And so we're going to see the execution of God's judgment and a remarkable instance of his preserving mercy in our text through three stages. The first and by far the longest, so don't despair as this gets long. Uh, the mad terror of promised judgment, chapters 9 and 10. So let's read 2 Kings 9, verses 1 to 10. Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, do not linger. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, to which of us all? And he said, to you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. When Jehu, oh, sorry, I'll stop there. So, last week we focused on Elisha. But here he appears just very briefly in the beginning. And then we don't hear again from him over these four chapters. And so he commissions an unnamed son of the prophets to go and deliver a most remarkable message. And you can imagine this guy's like, are you sure you don't want to just go and do this? But 
This young man is sent into Israel to find a man. He, he's carrying a flask of oil, and he's told to anoint this man he's never met and, and as Israel's next king, and then get out of there as quickly as he can. And that's precisely what he did. It, it's a strange scene as the leaders of the Israel army are gathered to protect their nation against Syria. And in comes this man that they don't know who calls for Jehu to have a private conference. And when they emerge from their meeting, uh, the stranger just heads out without a word, and Jehu comes out covered in and smelling of anointing oil and with a commission from God to be his agent of vengeance against the house of Ahab and Jezebel for their rebellion and their murder of his servants. But as Jehu emerges from that meeting, the rest of the commanders are still in the dark. And so is it any wonder that they ask in verse 11, is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? Surely the messenger must have seemed to be out of his mind. And they're understandably intrigued. Jehu tries to downplay it, but they press him and, and he eventually gets to the truth. He has been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And in reading Israel's history, we find something remarkable about Jehu. He is the only one in the north who's anointed to be king. During the whole time of the divided kingdom, he's the only northern king to be anointed. So clearly he's been specially chosen by God for this task. Well, the commanders respond instantly by proclaiming Jehu king. And, and in a foreshadowing of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem in Matthew 21, they lay down their garments before him. They are eager for a new king, and that probably reflects their discontent with Jehoram and his military failures. And so in verse 14 of chapter 9, Jehu begins his campaign. He leaves for Jezreel because that's where King Joram was, recovering from wounds that he had received in battle. And not only that, but we find that Joram's uncle by marriage, King Ahiza of Judah, was also there to visit him. They were uh, relatives they were also united in rebellion against God. And then we learn a, another interesting tidbit about Jehu in verse 20. He's apparently a NASCAR fan. And, and we discover that because as his party approaches Jezreel, King Joram sends out messengers. Who are these people, right? What, what are they coming from? And he, he tells them to say, is it peace? Sends out two messengers. And those messengers don't return. They, they join the party. But eventually this whole group gets near enough that the watchman is able to identify the leader of this approaching group. And how does he identify him? He says it must be Jehu because he drives furiously. Right? He's not the last man to be identified by the ferocity of his driving. Well, by this point, Joram must have had a growing sense of unease. And so he goes out himself to meet Jehu. And he, he asks him personally, is it peace? Well, here Jehu makes his purposes known in verse 22. He answered, what peace can there be so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Joram instantly realizes his problem. And so he reigns about and he flees as quickly as he can, crying out, treachery, O Ahiza. Then Jehu's bloody campaign begins. He draws his bow to full strength and he shoots the fleeing Joram through the shoulders right through the heart, killing him. And then he sends his servant to take the body of Joram and throw it onto the nearby ground of Naboth the Jezreelite. And that name ought to remind us of 1 Kings 21, where Ahab and Jezebel had conspired to steal the land of Naboth and his vineyards. Uh, righteous Naboth. They, they put him, and we learn in this passage, his sons also to death so that he can have his land. The Lord promised to repay Ahab on that plot of ground. And now Ahab's son is suffering that penalty. Jehu is very conscious that his vengeance is being accomplished, as verse 26 tells us, in accordance with the word of the Lord. Jehu then turns his attention to Ahaziah, who saw Joram's death and fled. Jehu's armies pursue him and they fatally shoot him and, and he flees and dies in Megiddo. And then his body's brought back to Jerusalem to the city of David, verse 29. He too is caught up in the Lord's vengeance on the house of Ahab, even as he had joined Ahab in his rebellion against the Lord. 
Verse 30 then brings us to one of the most wicked women in all of Scripture, in all of history, Jezebel. She had been a godless and a ruthless queen. And she is defiant even in death. We read that she painted her eyes and she adorned her head, seemingly determined to go out in style. She would not be intimidated by Jehu. And she, she even taunts him when she arrives. She leans out the window. And, and for the fourth time in this passage, she asks, is it peace? And then she calls him a Zimri, murderer of his master. Zimri, you'll remember, murdered the king, and then he himself reigned for only seven days, which seems to be what she's implying for Jehu. Well, Jehu sees servants up there, and so he challenges them to join his cause, and two or three eunuchs comply. They take her, they throw her out the window, where she plummets to her death on the ground, and she's trampled by horses, a terribly ignoble death. And then Jehu goes inside to eat and drink. But as he's doing so, he thinks, well, she was a queen in Israel, and so we should... We should treat her with respect. And so he sends servants out to bury her body. But when they try to do that, they can't. Because all they find is her skull, uh, her hand, her, the palms of her hands, and her feet. The dogs had devoured her in accordance with the prophecy of Elijah back in 1 Kings 21. Now, we still have another chapter of judgment to go under this first point, but... Before we get to chapter 10, I want to make two notes. First, notice that repeated allusion to peace. Joram and Jezebel both futilely ask Jehu for peace. And this is a pattern of those in rebellion against God. They they do the most wicked and destructive acts and then expect the Lord and his people to respond peaceably. I wonder if you've noticed that in the world around us. But peace was not Jehu's task. He was the Lord's agent of justice. And that might remind us of a a refrain that we saw repeatedly at the end of our sermon series in Isaiah. There is no peace for the wicked. The very end of the Bible sounds a similar note. We see in Revelation 19, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. This is the fate of the wicked. But Revelation 19 also expresses that second note that I think 2 Kings 9 is meant for us to apply. We ought to rejoice at the death of of the wicked, at the death of God's enemies. The Bible's very clear in both Testaments that God is very concerned with his people and what happens to them, how they're treated. The Lord knows the mistreatments that his people suffer. And so Ahab and Jezebel killed many prophets. They killed many righteous persons, including Naboth. And the Lord saw and the Lord remembered. He executed justice for the death of his people. As Christians, we're commanded not to take our own vengeance, but to entrust vengeance into the hands of the Lord. And then we're commanded to rejoice when he executes that vengeance. You see, what's the cry at the beginning of Revelation 19? Hallelujah. Praise be to God. He has executed justice on his enemies. We're meant to be encouraged and to take hope from the truth that the Lord is just and that evil cannot ultimately triumph. You'll remember at the outset today, I said this text would bring us face to face with sin and judgment. And what we're witnessing is the just judgment of God against his enemies for their rebellion against him. Now maybe you find that impolite or barbaric, or you think that's just a relic of a a bygone day. But if we're honest, we realize we have all been God's enemies. We've all rebelled against God. We've despised his word and his glory. We've lived for idolatrous pleasures. We deserve this treatment and much, much worse. But the wonder of the gospel is revealed at this very point, as Paul makes clear in Romans 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died. Who did he die for? The ungodly. 
For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for sinners. He he died for his enemies. It's not a coincidence that the entrance into the Christian life is described as a kind of death. Paul makes that connection in the next chapter in Romans 6, saying we've been united to Christ in a death like his, and he says baptism points us to that, so that we can be united with him in a resurrection like his. So those who've trusted in Christ and been united with him have been saved through judgment, as our our wickedness and our rebellion were punished on the cross so that we would not face the fate of Jezebel, and worse, the eternal torments of hell. So the gospel is not the avoidance of judgment. It's the full execution of judgment on another in our stead. God does not wave his hand at sin. Ah, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. He deals with it justly and fully. What a mercy. Well, returning to chapter 10 then, we we do not find mercy, but more judgment. Jehu knows that there are 70 sons of Ahab at Samaria, 70 potential rivals to the throne, 70 Baal worshippers, 70 wicked men. And so he writes a letter to the leaders of Samaria, and he he invites them. He says, look, just crown one of those sons and come out and let's fight. Well, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. But the leaders are intimidated, and so they write back a message of surrender. And so Jehu sends a second, somewhat ambiguous message to them. He says, take the the 70 heads of your master's sons and and meet me at Jezreel tomorrow. So they take the king's sons, they slaughter them, they decapitate them, they put their heads in baskets, and they send those baskets of 70 heads to Jezreel. Jehu then takes those heads and, and he piles them in heaps by the city gate, and and he speaks to the crowd gathered, announcing again that this judgment is from God. Verse 10, know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he said by his servant Elijah. All of Ahab's descendants in Jezreel have been killed, and it is the Lord's justice. Jehu then sets out for Samaria, And on the way, he meets some relatives of Ahaziah. He asks what they're doing, and they say, well, we're going to visit our relatives. That is, they're going to visit Ahab's family. So these are Jews from the south who seem to be pro-Ahab. They're from the house that is under the judgment of God. And so Jehu takes and slaughters the 42 of them, sparing not one. And then finally, in verse 15, he meets a man named Jehonadab who proclaims himself to be on Jehu's side. And so Jehu invites him to to join him. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord, verse 16. And they go to Samaria, and Jehu kills all of Ahab's descendants there as well. Again, as the text notes in verse 17, according to the word of the Lord. So Ahab's line has been ended completely, just as the Lord had promised. We mustn't soft pedal this. Jehu is an agent of justice and vengeance sent by God to punish his enemies. So does your idea of God make room for the wrath and vengeance of the Lord? Do you see how his goodness is linked to his holiness? Do you rejoice in his justice We must not sit over Scripture, judging it, saying, that that can't be. We have to submit to God's Word so we can respond rightly to His revelation. So we can appreciate the grace and mercy that He holds out to us. Recognizing the justice of God promotes the fear of the Lord, which fuels our devotion to Him, our humility before Him. But then in chapter 10, the text takes a turn and we think, oh no, here we go again. We have have another backsliding leader. And so verses 18 to 19. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. 
Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshipers and all his priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. The Lord had just punished Ahab and his house for their Baal worship. And now it seems that Jehu is going to follow their lead and even do worse. That is, until we read the very next words where he says he did this in cunning. He pretended to have zeal for Baal because he wanted to gather all of the Baal worshipers from all over Israel. And so he takes several steps to make sure that's what's happening. When they all come, he says, look, look all throughout. Make sure there's no servants of the Lord here. We don't want any servants of the Lord. And then when he's sure that it's all Baal worshipers, he, he brings out the vestments. He says, here, put on these vestments for worship, which, which functionally serve as uniforms. We know who the Baal worshipers are. They're, it's, they're marked out by their clothing. And then he takes 80 men and he stations them around. And he orders them to systematically kill all of the Baal worshipers, to, to tear down the temple and their objects of worship, and then to turn the house of Baal into a latrine, verse 27. This is total annihilation and total desecration of the idol. And verse 28 tells us, thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. Again, we're meant to rejoice at this news. This is good news. A false god has been removed from the midst of God's people. But it is not lasting news. Because the very next verse offers a distressingly familiar refrain for kings from the north. Verse 29, But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. We've seen this same refrain time and again in Israel with Jeroboam and with Baasha and with Omri and Ahab. And in the next few chapters, we're going to see it again and again with Jehoaz and Jehoash and Jeroboam II and Zechariah and Menachem and Pekiah and Pekah. So the, the golden calf worship of Israel in the north is their characteristic sin. And it persists all the way up to their exile in chapter 17. The, the similar failure of the kings of the south, the kings of Judah, is found in the phrase, he did not remove the high places from Judah. And so what we see is that persistent idolatry destroyed the people of God. Persistent idolatry invited the judgment of God. Persistent idolatry always brings chaos and destruction. The Lord calls us to whole hearted devotion to him. He is a jealous God. Though, note here, the Lord does reward Jehu, even though he was not a perfect instrument of justice. The Lord grants him a four-generation dynasty because he had done, verse 30 tells us, according to all that was in my heart. So Jehu had obeyed the Lord in bringing vengeance, even though he was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord with all his heart, verse 31 tells us, which is probably why verse 32 recounts that the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel and to give them to foreign conquerors. So the conquest of the northern tribes has begun and their exile is drawing nearer. Chapters 9 and 10 are very sobering. They're gruesome. These are bloody pictures of judgment and destruction. And they are the word of the Lord. It was the Lord's heart to destroy his enemies. That's what verse 30 says. You've done according to all that was in my heart. So we have to allow scriptures like these to inform and even correct us where we may have sentimental and misguided notions of who God is. He is holy. He is righteous. He is just. He is not mocked. He is committed to his glory and he will punish rebellion. And as we take those lessons to heart, we can better recognize and appreciate the, the sheer mercy held out to us in Jesus Christ. So, so we're freshly motivated to pursue wholehearted devotion to the Lord. For his promises are always sure. His promises of judgment are sure. We just saw that. 
and his promises of salvation are sure, and we're about to see that. So that brings us to our second point, the enduring certainty of promised salvation, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the bright note in today's text. It begins darkly as we read of another very wicked woman who is dedicated to rebellion against the Lord and the destruction of his people. But we also come to meet one of the lesser known but but most remarkable women in all of Scripture. So we begin with Athalia, the mother of Ahaziah. After he dies, she sees an opportunity for power. And so in verse 1 tells us she arose and destroyed all the royal family. Let those words sink in for a moment. We're in Judah. We're in Jerusalem. And this mother, this grandmother, killed all of her relatives so that she could rule in power. Lust for power is a persistent and potent motive in human affairs, and especially in the world of politics. Politicians almost always frame their programs as being about the good of someone. But often it's much more about accruing money and power and influence for themselves so they can be important, so they can rule over others. And we see that in Athalia. Her wickedness is not only murderous, it also threatens salvation itself. Remember, the Lord had promised a deliverer king to come through the line of of David, and, and even though Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab, she married Jehoram, the king of Judah, as a political alliance, and therefore she's brought, been brought into the line of David uh, through marriage. And so the, the royal family she destroys is David's entire line. There can be no deliverer if there are no descendants. And that's where we meet who Dale Ralph Davis has called the woman who saved Christmas. Verse 2 tells us of Jehoshaphat the daughter of King Joram and the sister of Ahaziah, who steals away a baby boy named Joash. And she hides him and his nurse in her apartment for six years while his wicked grandmother ruled over Judah. Later, we'll we'll find out that Jehoshaphat is not only royal herself, she's also the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, who, who plays a crucial role in this story. And so this godly couple rescued the line of David, the line of Jesus, from utter destruction. Imagine the courage of this woman. How many times must she have feared discovery over six years? She must have known what the penalty would be if she were discovered. She she would certainly face death. But she feared the Lord more than she feared the queen. And so her acts of service have become part of the remarkable storyline of the gospel. And one other note in this, we see again the subversive presence of the kingdom of God. Earthly rulers rise and fall, and and, and wicked tyrants triumph for a season. And when they do, the people of God suffer. But even as Athalia sat on the throne and reigned, the true king was growing up in that same city, probably just a few hundred yards away. The true king, representing the kingdom of God, growing up in the midst of tyranny and oppression, waiting for the Lord's perfect timing. Tyrants always fall, and the kingdom of God always triumphs in the Lord's time. Here, that time came when Joash was seven. We see that in verse four. So Jehoiada, the priest, summons the guards. He makes a covenant with them, and he reveals the boy to them. He he announces his plan to replace Athaliah on the throne with the rightful king of Judah. And so on that day, the the guards form a defensive perimeter around the temple, verse 12. And then he brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and they said, long live the king. The response of the people was immediate and palpable. They were no doubt ready for the reign of Athalia to end, and they rejoiced at the coming of the true king. But Athalia did not. When she hears the noise, she goes to the temple, and she sees the king standing in his rightful place, and she's outraged, and she tears her clothes, and she cries, treason, treason. This is one of the great pictures of irony in the Bible. She's herself a traitor, and she can't imagine anyone rebelling against her. So Jehoiada orders her to be removed from the temple and to be put to death, and she is. And then he holds a covenant renewal ceremony. 
He calls Judah to renewed fidelity to the Lord. And immediately we see one of the reasons that's needed because there's a house of Baal in Jerusalem. It's bad enough it was in Israel. Now it's in the city of David, a house of Baal. And one of the ways that we know that the people are repentant and trusting the Lord is they immediately go and they destroy that temple. They tear it down. They kill its priest. And then they march the king to his house and he, they place him on his throne. And the verdict is given in verse 20. So all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword at the king's house. And so this is a kind of, of mini jubilee. The people are rejoicing. The city's at rest. And wickedness has been eradicated. And from a human level, it's all because of the gutsy faith of one woman. In fact, looking back, we see there's no direct words from the Lord given in this chapter. This is clearly the Lord's hand at work, but but much like the book of Esther, he's not explicitly mentioned as a character, and and there are lessons there for us as well. We are not Davids and Abrahams. We're not Sarahs or Rahabs. We're we're much more like Jehoshaphat, right? Largely unknown people, providentially placed by the Lord in positions of responsibility, and the Lord doesn't generally call us to make some dramatic splash, to make some big move, but, it, but to be faithful to what he has entrusted to us. On one level, Jehoshaphat's actions were not remarkable. She opened her home to an orphaned relative and his nurse. She provided for them, commendable for sure, sacrificial, but not unique. But on another level, she preserved the line of David when it was at its lowest ebb. And the Lord used her to deliver a nation from its wicked queen. So you never know how the Lord will use your humble acts of service in your day-to-day responsibilities to fulfill his purposes and to advance his kingdom. You may be sure of this. Everything that you do in obedience to God and in faith is seen by God. It's ordained by God. It will be rewarded by God and it is used by God for the good of his people and for his glory. That's part of why he calls us to pursue wholehearted devotion to him because his promises are always sure. And that brings us to our final point, the disappointing results of compromised politics, which is chapter 12. Chapter 12 begins on the same note of triumph that chapter 11 ended on. Joash or Jehoash is now king. He will reign for 40 years, which is a good long reign. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, we're told, because the priest instructed him. But note again the familiar failing of the southern kings in verse 3. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people continued to sacrifice and make offerings on the high places. And so he's good, not perfect, doesn't complete the reform. But he does seem to have the right priorities. And so in verse 4, he launches a program to repair the temple. The temple would have been over 100 years old at this point. It was in need of repairs. It had been neglected. And so he calls for offerings to be made, and and he entrusts the repairs to the priests. We don't know how long he waited, but we do know that by the time he was 30, in his 23rd year, the priests had made no repairs. We don't know why. The the text doesn't tell us. It doesn't seem like they were stealing. It seems much more likely that they were just kind of apathetic. They didn't want to spend the money on that project. And so when he calls for an accounting and they can give no progress, he says, okay, no more money for you. Then Jehoiada, the priest, comes up with a better plan. He takes a locked chest and he drills a hole in the top and he puts it outside with two guards. And the people come and make free will offerings. And when they take the money to count it, there's two men who go with accountability to to account for it. And then they give the monies directly into the hands of the workmen who are repairing the temple. There's many principles of sound financial and business dealings right there. So these repairs are finally being made, and there's progress at last. But then verse 13 says, but there's, there's no precious vessels being made for the temple. So though, though the repairs were happening, we're not getting back to the glory of the temple that it had under Solomon. It's progress, but not full restoration. And then we come to verses 17 and 18, which gives us a, a distressing turn. At that time, Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. But when Hazael set his face to go up against Jerusalem, 
Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred gifts that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, the kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own sacred gifts, and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house, and sent these to Hazael, king of Syria. And Hazael went away from Jerusalem. So he's threatened, Israel, or Judah's being threatened by Hazael. It's the same man who the Lord had promised to be one of his agents of vengeance in 1 Kings 19. He, he, he and Elisha and Jehu. He's the same man who, in last week's passage, Elisha wept over because he foresaw the destruction that this man would wreak on God's people. He is a real threat. But all the way back in 1 Kings 8, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon had foreseen this possibility. He knew that oppression from a foreigner was a sign of God's judgment on his people for their sin. And so repeatedly in that dedication message, he, he calls the people of God to own and their, confess their sins, to repent and to return to the Lord to cry out to the Lord and to wait for him for deliverance. That's the response of faith during hard times. Not shrewd maneuverings, not pragmatism, not buying your way out of it, but humble faith and repentance that seeks the Lord and looks to him to deliver. Joash does not do that. Like Rehoboam and Asa before him and like Ahaz and Hezekiah after him, He engages in what he thinks will be shrewd political bargaining in order to achieve his desired end of peace and safety. He buys it. And in a moment, he undoes all that he had spent his reign doing. He's building and repairing the temple, and then all the riches are taken out of the temple and shipped to Syria. It's a one-time purchase of temporary peace at great cost. That is the folly, the picture of the folly of human wisdom. And so this passage ends on a low note in verses 19 to 20. Now, the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? His servants arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash in the house of Milo on the way that goes down to Silla. It was Josachar, the son of Shimeath, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants who struck him down so that he died. And they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. So Joash, whose very existence was a spectacular example of the providential strength and power and wisdom of God, and whose program of restoration had seemed so promising, loses it all in political compromise and dies an ignominious death at the hands of conspiring servants. Psalm 146.3 tells us, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation, When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. We've certainly seen that today, haven't we? Every one of these leaders has a mixed record at best. Some are just entirely evil. Some do good, sometimes much good. But they all fall short and in critical ways. And in that, we're reminded of the truth. We have only one lasting and ultimate hope. There's only one prince whose reign is holy and pure. There's only one king who truly rules for the good of his subjects. There's only one prophet who always speaks the truth and directs us to put our faith in God. There's only one priest who, who effectively mediates for his people and his, who is himself the full and lasting and atoning sacrifice for sin. Therefore, our hope and our devotion and our peace should be sought only In him, political fortunes rise and fall. Business fortunes come and go. But the kingdom of our God and of his Christ will endure forever. So pursue wholehearted devotion to the Lord for his promises are always sure. They're always sure, unfailing. 